So I know I said I hated the last problem, problem four of the practice problems in the Praxis 5165 test, but compared to problem five, problem four is great. Problem five is just terrible. I hate this problem more than four. Because unlike four, which is kind of annoying, five to me feels wrong or ambiguous or something. So first, the question. Miss Quinn asked her student to solve the following quadratic equation. Doesn't give us any information about how the student was supposed to solve the equation, just solve the equation. The way I think about it, generally there's three different ways to solve quadratic equations. You can use the quadratic formula, the whole negative b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a thing. You can complete the square if you're really good with algebra. It's a clever little trick that's actually more useful than you might think. Or you can try to factor. Factoring is the most straightforward way to solve these, often the cleanest. The only problem is not all quadratic trinomials factor, or more technically factor over the rational numbers, whatever. Three different ways, do it however you want. For these specific numbers, I think the most efficient way to solve would be by factoring. So maybe first you would notice that all three terms are divisible by three, so you might as well divide both sides of the equation by three to get x squared minus two x minus eight equals zero. And then because your leading coefficient is now a one, in order to factor this, in other words, rewrite the left-hand side of the equation so that it looks kind of like what I have here on the left side of this equation. What I need to do is find two numbers whose product is negative 8 and whose sum is negative 2. Two numbers that multiply to negative 8 and add to negative 2. Let's see, negative 4 and positive 2 will do the trick. So the negative 4 and the positive 2 go in these two spots. What I've now done is referred to as factoring. The nice thing about this factored form is I have something times something equals zero, and there's this thing called the multiplicative property of zero that says that anytime you have something times something equals zero, the only way that can happen is if one of those things themselves is equal to zero. So this mathematical statement is equivalent to these two mathematical statements, either the x minus four thing equals zero or the x plus two thing equals zero. I change this one quadratic equation into these two linear equations, which themselves are easy to solve. Add four to both sides, subtract two from both sides. You're like, yeah, I know how to factor. That wasn't what the question was asking me to do. The question is asking me to look at how Maurice did this, which is very different than how I did this, and then sort of critique or comment upon his method. So what did he do? His first step is he added 24 to both sides of the equation, a completely legitimate algebraic step. The only problem is now the right-hand side of our equation is 24 and not zero. So if we get to a stage like we do down here, we won't be able to apply the multiplicative property of zero. But whatever, nothing wrong algebraically. He then recognized that all three of these terms are divisible by three, so he divided them all by three, much like we did in the first step. x squared minus two x equals eight. I mean, really, where he ended up is almost identical to where we were right here. He just got the eight on the other side of the equation. But here's where the paths diverge. Students are often told that it only helps to factor when the other side of the equation is set equal to zero, so that you can apply this multiplicative property of zero, where you change this one quadratic equation into these two linear equations. That's a bit of an overstatement. If you're gonna apply the multiplicative property of zero, then you need the equation to be set equal to zero, but you don't need to apply that multiplicative property of zero. You can factor the left-hand side of this equation regardless of what's on the other side of the equation, and that's exactly what Maurice did. He recognized that we have an x in each of these terms, factored it out, so we got x times x minus two equals eight. I'd argue that to get to this stage where x times x minus two equals eight using his method is easier than to get to this stage where we have x minus four times x plus two equals zero. I mean, they're similar, but over here you needed to be kind of clever in this factoring stage. And I know you don't view it as that clever because you've seen this method before, but if you hadn't, you'd probably struggle getting from this line to this line. Over here on the left side, things were a lot more straightforward. Right, get the constant turn over on the other side, divide by three to make the number smaller, pull out an x from each of these two terms. The factoring over here is a lot easier than the factoring over here. The problem is below the blue line is really easy on the right side, whereas below the blue line on the left side is arguably more difficult. And I say arguably because the correct answer to this question is C here, where they say, this method often results in an equation that cannot be solved by inspection. That is, by reasoning about the factors of the constant term and the resulting equation. I hate that. I think that that's garbage. Before I cry more about that, let me talk more about how Maurice finished the problem here. Say I got something times something equals eight, and those two things must differ by two because one of them is x and the other one is just two less than whatever that x is. So what two numbers multiply to give me eight where those two numbers are separated by only two? 
Well, let's see, two times four gives me eight, and two and four are only separated by two. So one possible set of values for x and x minus two are two and four, in which case the x would be equal to four, and the x minus two would be four minus two, aka two. However, that's not the only way I can find two numbers that differ by two and multiply together to give me eight. I could also take negative two and negative four. In that case, playing the role of the x would be the negative two, because the negative two minus two more would give me negative four. Negative two times negative four also gives me positive eight. So I have two different solutions, either x is four or x is negative two, the exact same solutions that I got over here. The point of this problem is you're supposed to recognize that what this person did was correct here, but what this person did here, I don't know, is harder, doesn't extrapolate as well. And at this point, you probably agree with that assessment. However, I'd argue that the only reason you probably think the right side is easier than the left side is the right side is the way you learned it. It's more familiar to you. I don't think that there's anything fundamentally different between what's done over here on the right and what's done over here on the left. The challenging thing on the left is looking at this equation and finding two numbers that multiply together to give you eight and so that the difference between those two numbers is only two. The challenging thing over here on the right side is to stare at this quadratic trinomial and understand that what's being asked of you is to find two numbers, negative four and positive two in this case, that multiply together to give you negative eight and add together to give you negative two. That's not any easier than what you're doing over here. It's just more familiar to you. You might argue that, yeah, in this case, both the numbers work, but what if instead of x times x minus two equals eight, it were, I don't know, x times x minus two equals seven. Then what would you do? Try to come up with two numbers so that when you multiply them together, you get seven. And so that the difference between those two numbers is just two. You won't be able to do it. And I'd be like, right. But that would arise if I were trying to solve the equation x squared minus 2x equals 7. In other words, x squared minus 2x minus 7 equals 0. And if I started out with this equation right here, I wouldn't be able to solve it by factoring anyways. So I guess what I'm saying is if you have a problem like this that can be solved by factoring, then Maurice's solution is every bit as good as the more standard factoring algorithm. Well, what if you have a problem that you can't solve by factoring? Then you can't solve it by factoring. But if you're the teacher and a student did the problem this way, would you be like, oh, that's great work, student. However, your method often results in an equation that cannot be solved by inspection. That is, reasoning about the factors of the constant term in the resulting equation. No, you wouldn't. You'd be like, great, I gave you a problem to factor. You factored it. You solved it. That's fantastic. You now know how to factor. Similarly, Maurice was given a problem that can be solved by factoring. He factored it. He got the right answer. That's fantastic. Any problem that can be solved by factoring can be solved in arguably the same amount of difficulty by doing something analogous to Maurice's solution here. Right? What's a, what's a harder, and I use harder with big air quotes, quadratic trinomial with the leading coefficient of one? I don't know, x squared, let's say minus 5x, I don't know, minus 14 equals zero. Sure. If you're given this problem, you had to factor it. You need to find two numbers that multiply to give you negative 14 and that add to give you negative five. Think about that for a minute and you'll probably come up with negative seven and positive two and you'll be able to solve this equation, get x equals seven and x equals negative two. Maurice would be like, hey, good job, but check this out. I could make it x squared minus five x equals 14 and then factor an x on the left side. And now all I gotta do is find two numbers that are different by five so that when I multiply those two numbers, I get 14 as my answer. What two numbers work? Well, let's see, seven and two would be one pair. Playing the role of the x would be the seven, and playing the role of x minus five would be seven minus five or two. But I could also get there with negative seven and negative two, in which case playing the role of the x would be the negative two, and the negative two minus five would give you the negative seven. You get the exact same answers here as you do up here. There's nothing fundamentally different between Maurice's solution and the more standard factoring algorithm, anytime you're given a quadratic trinomial with the leading coefficient of one that can be solved by factoring. So this is ridiculous. Assuming you would answer D for a student who solved things this way, I argue that you would have to answer D for Maurice as well. But this test feels differently. This test seems to think that C is the correct answer for Maurice's solution. So I guess that's what we're going with here. So dumb.